Hello. This is yeah. Mila Mitra. Uh, I'm scientific officer with Space. And uh, today I have here with us David Dubois, our guest speaker, and uh, Mr. Abhinav Dubey. He's our uh, educator in charge. Uh, I'm scientific officer with Space. And uh, today I have here with us David Dubois, uh, uh, our guest speaker, and uh, Mr. Abhinav Dubey. He's our uh, educator in charge. The echo is coming. Okay, so um, I'll go ahead. So we have an echo, so I have to deal with that right now. Uh, Abhina? Yes, Mila. Uh, maybe turn your feed off. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll just, I'll just. Uh, right. Okay, now check, Mila. Check. Uh, uh, yeah, we're fine now. Yeah. You're fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So again, uh, welcome on behalf of Space. Uh, you know, we have many students going to join us today. Uh, this month, April, David. Uh, you know, we are celebrating Global Astronomy Month this month, and that's um, part of uh, something that Astronomers Without Borders celebrates, and yes. uh, it's a month of celebration. And I'm sure you know you, you're probably involved. So. Space, which we are part of, Abhinav and I are part of, are celebrating Global Astronomy Month with students all around the country, and they're doing different activities every day. And as part of that, we are hosting these hangouts with uh, different, uh, you know, guest speakers, just to get, give our chance, uh, give our students a chance to interact with more uh, speakers. So we are doing this global hangout today as part of Global Astronomy Month. So let me introduce David, and uh, then I would uh, ask, ask you to go ahead and give your presentation. So David Dubois is 25 years old. He's uh, currently doing his PhD. He started studying Earth sciences and environmental geology at the University of Orleans in France. And then he, uh, he did his master's in planetary science in Paris. He's working on... Uh, the tidal stress modeling of Europa with Bob Papillardo, project scientist of the Europa mission at the Jet Propulsion Lab in California. Then he started his PhD on Titan at the Latmos Lab in Paris in collaboration with JPL. Currently, he's working on Titan, Europa, Triton, and he's recently started working on exoplanets as well. His main interest is the icy moons of the solar system. And um, that's what he's going to talk to us today, the icy moons of the solar system. And uh, David is multifaceted. And besides what he's doing for his PhD, he's also he does outreach. Uh, he communicates pl planetary science to you know, people and to the public. And that's where we met him at a public uh, talk. And again, besides his PhD, he also does karate and plays the piano. And, uh, you know, he's especially going to bond with all of us Indians here today because David does Bhangra. And he's part of a group called Paris Bhangra. So next time, uh, we'll uh, have him do that demonstration also. So yes, welcome, David. Thank you, Mila. Thank you. Well, it is a, a real honor to be to be here today with everyone. and. Um, especially part of this Global Astronomy Month of April. Um, so thank you everyone at Space India for organizing this and, and tuning in. It's a real pleasure. So I'm going to switch over to my presentation right now. Yeah, and as you're doing it, I just want to introduce Abhinav, who is also our uh, educator in charge. And anybody who's logged in, you're welcome to type your questions. And after David is done with the presentation, uh, Abhinav will uh, take the questions and uh, you know read them out. Abhinav, do you want to say a few words? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Abhinav Prakash Dubey. I am uh, working as an uh, education in charge for workshops in space technology and education. So we are here uh, teaching a lot of students about space and astronomy. And today we have David. We all are lucky enough to have him because we have 
numerous questions to ask him about the same and i'll take your questions too david so thank you everyone and stay tuned thanks okay. yeah dave david go ahead okay so good morning everyone um I'm, I'm going to talk can you hear me well uh yeah we can okay, okay. So I'm going to talk about my favorite region of the solar system, which is the outer solar system, where ice is the new rock, basically. <laughs> so everything's very cold and everything's covered in ice. And specifically, I'm going to talk about Europa, Titan, and Triton. So um, I'm going to give a, a general brief overview of these, these different moons. And so if there's any, of course, uh, some more specific and more uh, detailed questions, We'll have the, the question uh, session after, or I have also my email address here, which you can write me anytime. So let's get right to it. Um, here is what we call the Solar System Yearbook, where you have, um, as of uh, 2015, you have the 33 largest objects in the solar system in order of mean radius. And each of the pictures are, are the pictures corresponding to the first pictures taken by these different objects. And so you see quickly after the sun, you get these outer giant uh, gas planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, which are really, really big, made out of gas, uh, a lot of pressure and in deep into the interior. Then you have the Earth, Venus, Mars, and instead of getting Mercury, uh, you get two moons, actually, Ganymede and Titan, and then Mercury. So, which is interesting because, which, you know, tells us that, oh, actually, there's moons that are bigger than planets. Um, uh, namely Ganymede and Titan. And then you've got these moons like Callisto, Io, our moon, Europa, Triton, and so forth. So which gives us you know, an idea that uh, these moons are, are not, uh, um, are very important in our solar system. So that's why it's prompted a lot of people over the years to study them and understand their, their history, their uh, current uh, surface and, and atmosphere um, characteristics and, and future evolution. So everything pretty much started with Galileo, who um, something like 400 years ago did a lot of observation uh, of, of Jupiter mostly, and, and kind of, so here you can see this, this draft, this original draft by Galileo, where he showed that um, Jupiter, which is kind of this circle with a star in it, was circled by different objects, which he thought were stars in the beginning. But then, uh, as, as the nights moved on and he, he wrote down his, his observations, he saw that these stars, uh, so to speak, were moving about, about Jupiter. And so he, he deducted from these observations that these were actually not stars, but moons orbiting another planet, a planet which is not Earth, but in this case, Jupiter. And so for, for really the first, time, the first time here, he showed that the Earth was not the only object that uh, had a moon, orbiting it, but other planets as well could, could, be, could have moons orbiting them. So this was a really uh, important discovery uh, and kind of um, you know, changed our perception of, of the solar system itself. And if you, if you, use, uh, if you were to use his, his own telescope, the Occhiale, they called it, um, which he built, you would see this, this bright, bright Jupiter right now. So you would have to be a very patient observer to really uh, see any moon around, around Jupiter at that time. And then if you kind of fast forward 400 years later, you, you get this a very nice picture of our solar system here with the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and, and that uh, x-axis, the, the scale is basically the, the Earth-Sun distance as a reference. So you got the Sun and the Earth as one, and then 10 means 10 times the Earth-Sun distance and so forth. And then you get these outer gas giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, uh, which really here is, is, is our main uh, focus here. Um, so what, what a new term that, that kind of came out a few months ago is, is the not planets. Basically, it's all these objects, relatively large objects um, in the solar system, where uh, that are not planets, but are moons for the most part and behave in a very complex way, in a, in a, in a, whether it's the geology, whether it's uh, subsurface liquid ocean, whether it's atmospheres and chemistry. It's got a lot of, of uh, complex stuff happening, whether in the interior or on the surface. And so this is a new uh, fun term to use the not planets in, in that respect. 
Um, so when we say icy moon, what, what do we mean really? Basically a moon, so it's a, it's a relatively smaller object or orbiting a relatively bigger object called the, the planet, the parent body, the planet itself. And an icy moon basically, uh, there's, a, there's dozens and dozens of them in the outer solar system, which is a category of satellites whose surface is completely frozen and in most cases um, has a, a subsurface liquid ocean. So here you see, for example, um, Europa or Titan, which have respectively uh, more than two times and 11 times Earth's water volume uh, taken as a whole. So even though these, these moons are very small um, uh, relatively to, to, uh, to planets, Yet, they have large quantities, we assume, of, of liquid water uh, in, the, in their interior. And in most cases, basically, as we'll see in, in future slides, you have this, this surface which is uh, covered in ice, and then you have this big liquid water ocean overlying, directly overlying uh, a mantle, where you have this nice contact of rocky and water uh, contact in the interior. So this is something that that's really uh, that's really fascinating in, in the search of, of uh, water in the solar system and eventually what we call habitable conditions that are favorable for potential life uh, of any sorts. So here here are the three moons um, uh, scaled down to size to one another that we're going to talk about today. So the first top is Europa around Jupiter, which is at about a distance of five times the Sun Earth distance. Uh, what we call the astronomical units, and you see that the, the surface of Europa is very nice, very unique, in that it has very bright regions, very white regions, more, and then regions that are more reddish, uh, uh, orangish, and lots of these ridges, these what we call the cycloids, uh, fract fractures and cracks in the ice, which kind of uh, have been preserved in the, in the geological cycle of the ice uh, over millions of years, and so. So this is it. So basically, uh, Europa was first extensively studied by the Galileo mission, which, which was an, a NASA mission that ended uh, some 14 years ago, um, which was launched in 1989 and aboard a, the space shuttle Atlantis, as the left picture shows. And on the lower uh, right-hand side, you have the, the, the diagram of the, of the spacecraft itself. So you get, you know, you have this uh, this this whole system of, of magnetospheric, magnetometer uh, boom. You have these uh, low and high gain antenna. And at the, at the very bottom, you can maybe see that there's, there was also a Jupiter atmospheric probe, which was on board the spacecraft. And eventually, uh, in 1995, was actually released from the spacecraft and descended, uh, did an atmospheric descent into the atmosphere in, or, in order to do any science of the atmosphere of Jupiter. And uh, the higher, uh, the, the, the right picture on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, it's a, it's a full-scale picture I, I took at, at a museum of the uh, magnetic tape recorder that was on board the, the spacecraft, which had, uh, at the time, um, a storage capacity of 114 megabytes. So very, uh, to today's standards, quite relatively uh, uh, low storage. But at the time, all of that data was stored on, into that tape and then sent back to Earth. So that was, that was something really cool. And so here you get this, this nice um, uh, image of, of Europa here, where uh, I'm going to play this little movie here. I hope it works. OK. So you see yeah. what ha what's happening here is that you have Europa, which is orbiting about Jupiter. And on the left-hand side, you have a diagram of this, uh, this moon which is not to scale in, in terms of uh, size, but something that's really that I really want to stress on here is what we call the eccentricity. And the eccentricity is, is a value between zero and one, where you can, which basically determines your, your orbit, the shape of your orbit. So an eccentricity of zero will be um, you know, a, a perfect uh, circle orbit, and one will be a more of an elliptic one, so very highly stretched. And so it happens that Europa has, uh, has this eccentricity of 0 0.009, in which case you sometimes get closer to Jupiter and sometimes you get farther away. So the closest point is called the perigeove, and then the farthest point is called apogeove. And so what's happening here is that as Europa goes through its orbit, 
uh, of, of, a, of a few, just a few Earth days long, you, you kind of go through different uh, gravitational uh, fields around Jupiter. Remember, Jupiter is very, the largest planet in the solar system, so it has a strong gravitational pull around its moon and, and its environment. And so Europa uh, deals with it, this, uh, this time-varying gravitational pull and reacts uh, naturally and geologically reacts to this by kind of uh, doing the squeezing. That's not to scale here, but to just show it for the sake of uh, educational reasons. And so you see that kind of like a, a fresh squeezed orange juice, kind of which you would squeeze like this, uh, Europa is being squeezed in and eventually tidally heated because of the friction of the rocks into its mantle. And so this, in turn, creates this tidal heating that uh, it manages to uh, create or, or maintain this liquid water ocean just above the mantle. And then, as you go up, you see this, this outer icy shell that uh, kind of protects or blankets this ocean. So this is what's, what we think is happening here, and, and, and the main uh, cause of this is, is, is simply eccentricity. So as soon as you start creating these tides and this tidal heating, can eventually uh, maintain a liquid water ocean in the interior of any kind. So on the lower part of the slide, you get to, uh, at this time we, we are still uh, far from knowing any kind of uh, thickness or depths of these oceans and sea crust. Uh, but we kind of have different models. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have what we call a thinner model, which you have this outer crust of the shell of Europa, which, which overlies this uh, liquid ocean. On the right-hand side, you have more of a, a double layer crust, where you have a lower part, which is more kind of slushy, like a, kind of an ice cream, uh, I would say, in ductile, we call it. And in, in this case, you would have some convection and, and heat that's brought up from all the way down from the mantle. And then above that, you have that icy shell, which protects everything. So this is our, our current understanding of uh, Europa's interior, which Galileo uh, helped a lot in the photographs. And if you take a closer look at, at some pictures of the surface of Europa, so here the, the point facing uh, Jupiter, the sub point, you see, uh, as, as the picture earlier showed, all these cracks and fractures and, and ridges on the surface of Europa, uh, which with uh, uh, brighter regions, more darker ones, and so, really, Europa is globally covered with this, uh, some, all these fascinating geological features. And if I go to the next slide, I'll get a, a nice uh, overview of some of these features. So, at the top uh, left hand side, you have the Pearl Crater, uh, which, is one, which is one of uh, Europa's most famous craters near the South Pole. And the little sun images correspond to the direction of illumination. It's part of the picture was taken. And then you've got uh, these kind of model terrain uh, on, the, on the lower left hand side, the Thrace Macula, which maybe could correspond to uh, locally and, and thermally, uh, thermal anomalies that could in the past kind of melt your surface and, and eat up your ridges as it's seen here with this nice boundary. Uh, then you've got these linear, all these crisscrossed. Ridges, the androgynous linear, for example, where you can eventually compare this with Earth's uh, ridges and see, you know, and kind of recreate the history which one happened, happened first and, and create that history. And then you get the chaotic terrain, the chaos terrain here, uh, or Konamara, which is one of Europa's also the most famous ones. We have this kind of uh, all these bits and pieces of, of large scale um, ice blocks that were frozen in time, and, and as it is shown here. And so, which also hints at a possible um, way back in the past of your uh, time of Europa, which hint at, uh, at, a, at a time where the surface could have been partially uh, melted and, and then refroze and, and, and left everything in place as it is. So, you know, the surface of, of, um, of Europa is estimated to be about 60 million years uh, old. So in, in geologic terms, it's rather uh, young. And so basically the surface we're seeing right now was formed when the dinosaurs got extinct. 
So it's a very um, young surface, and it's hard to, because of this, it's hard to go even back, more back in time, and, and determine how things were uh, even hundreds of millions ago, years ago. And here is just uh, for comparison, uh, there's the San Andreas Fault in California in the, in the United States, where you can also, something that's really interesting when you study the, the surface of Europa, it's very unique, yet you can still compare some of these ridges with the, for example, this fault here in California, and kind of uh, and, and try to constrain the, the, the geological processes that, that created these features. Okay, so, and just to finish with uh, this, uh, this first part, um, the, the current state of uh, mission planning for Europa is, is, uh, is all revolving around the Europa Clipper mission, which is a NASA mission, uh, which uh, has just entered its phase B of design, and it will basically uh, launch in, in, in less than 10 years from now, uh, and will come into orbit around Jupiter and uh, do about 45 flybys of Europa. So it will have an extensive uh, global coverage of Europa. It will do um, also an extensive study of its surface, of its uh, exosphere, the, the very thin atmosphere around Europa, as well as its interior uh, geology. And so here is just a list of the different instruments that will be on the spacecraft. We have imaging systems to take pictures of the surface at a very high resolution, uh, even more so than Galileo's images. You will have uh, radar um, altimetry to, to really sound the surface and the, the icy crust. You will also have thermal emission imaging systems to, to see any kind of um, thermal anomalies in the, in the interior. Uh, and, 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 and something also that's also very exciting, and so as the picture on the right uh, hand side shows, is that we also think that uh, thanks to a, a few observations of Europa, that there could be some venting systems and some plumes coming out of near this, uh, the south pole of Europa, and perhaps some water being ejected through cracks and, and, and the surface, so which is being probably fed by the um, subsurface ocean. And so this is something that the Europa Clipper mission will also be uh, interested in, is, is kind of detecting and, and constraining these observations, but much closer to Europa this time. Okay, so with that being said, now our, our second stop will be Titan around Saturn. Um, it's at a distance of nine times the Sun-Earth distance, roughly. And Titan is also a very interesting moon. It's the second largest moon in our solar system, as you can see here uh, in front of Saturn. And the only moon in our solar system that has uh, an appreciable atmosphere, and a very dense atmosphere. As a matter of fact, its surface atmosphere is about 1.5 times the surface atmosphere on Earth. So it's a very dense one. And so Titan has been studied mostly through the Cassini-Huygens mission, which is a joint collaboration between NASA and ESA, the European Space Agency. And it's almost been 20 years into space, uh, launched in 1997 from, uh, from this uh, Titan uh, Centaur rocket, as you can see. And so, you know, the Cassini mission has, has, is probably my, my favorite mission. Um, <laughs> and it's been in space, as I said, for almost 20 years now, uh, an orbit around Saturn for more than 12 years almost 13 years, and the really nice uh, thing about this mission is that it's been uh, orbiting Saturn, but it also had a Huygens probe, which was built by the European Space Agency. And so what happened is that this probe eventually uh, got detached from Cassini and descended into Titan's atmosphere, and, um, and, and then landed on the surface and studied it, the surface for a while. And ever since, the Cassini mission has, uh, the spacecraft itself, has been orbiting Saturn many, many times, doing many flybys of Titan and countless of other moons. Uh, dozens of, of moons were discovered thanks to this mission. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of orbits were completed around Saturn. So it's a very, very rich uh, mission that, uh, that brought a lot of, of new uh, scientific interest to, interest to this uh, system. Um, also, what I wanted to say was that this mission is coming to an end, unfortunately, uh, which uh, is supposed to end on the 15th of September with a final daring finale, uh, plunge into uh, Saturn's atmosphere. 
which will, uh, this part of the end of the mission is called the grand finale, which will start in a few weeks, actually, on April 22nd, with the final close flyby of Titan. And essentially, the mission will use fly Titan as a, as a gravitational assist to come closer and closer to Saturn, and eventually do a daring uh, orbit, uh, series of orbits near between uh, Saturn and the innermost rings for the first time ever. So it'll be very exciting. And when is that the schedule for? So the, the final plunge, the, the atmospheric entry into Saturn's atmosphere will be on se se this coming September 15th. And the final Titan close flyby will be April 22nd, so in a couple weeks. Right. Yeah. So Titan, um, here you have this, this cool image uh, where you see edge on, uh, the, the limb view, we call it, which is the outer edge of, of this moon. And you see that there's, uh, there's this very thick atmosphere. You can't really see the surface. It's very opaque. But you can see at very high altitudes here at about 500 kilometers up, this uh, detached uh, layer, which corresponds to a haze layer, a very um, thick aerosol layer that, that is detached from the rest of the moon at about 500 kilometers uh, in altitude. And so what's interesting about Titan is, as I said, it has a very thick atmosphere, uh, a dense one of about 1.5 uh, times the, the Earth's surface atmosphere. The surface is also very cold, about on average 94 Kelvin, uh, very cold, uh, almost negative 200 degrees Celsius. And its atmosphere is mostly composed of um, molecular nitrogen, N2, and also a few percent of methane, CH4. And what's also very, and so what's also very unique to Titan, um, if you try to compare this with Earth's atmosphere, is that its atmosphere extends all the way up to almost 1,500 kilometers, so very high up, uh, mostly due to Titan's uh, lower gravity, gravity. And so here we have this, uh, this, this interesting diagram here where you can see the uh, atmospheric profile of Titan and with the temperature and the altitude. And then you got on the left-hand side, you got all of the different instruments from the Cassini spacecraft and their approximate coverage um, altitudinal coverage of each instrument. And so during my, my PhD, my main focus here is to try to understand the chemistry that happens at the upper atmosphere of Titan. And so, uh, you know, you, usually we can use instrument uh, data from uh, INMS or CAPS data, as you can see, which really are focused on the upper atmosphere of Titan. And so, as I was saying, we have this N2 and CH4. And because Titan is in a very uh, very interesting and unique place around Saturn. It gets all this electron and ion and, and, and sunlight uh, photon deposition high up in the atmosphere, which it ch which essentially breaks down uh, your molecules into different ions and, and neutral species, um, and and creates this this very unique uh, chemistry, where eventually. Uh, you know, you have different chemical reactions that aggregate molecules with one another and create larger and larger molecules, even very large ions. And this process is so efficient on Titan that you eventually uh, create solid particles, aerosols. Uh, we can also make those aerosols in the lab, and we call them tholins. So these, these aerosols basically uh, are, are what is uh, composed in, in this detached haze. Remember that picture, that detached haze layer we see, and all the way down to the surface. So that's why Titan is so uh, invisible in the visible light with our uh, naked eye, because the atmosphere is covered with this haze, this, this, uh, these aerosols, which are, which are very opaque. And so this is also very interesting, because all these aerosols that are formed in the upper atmosphere uh, precipitate and trickle down all the way down to the surface and then and then new chemistry happens on the surface so as this happens you've got um, you know you could you could probably do an entire PhD on, on one specific altitude <laughs> if you wanted to at least start understanding the chemistry of Titan. it's so complex uh, that um, but yet a very rich organic chemistry and speaking of the surface on, on Titan, so on the left-hand side, you have a picture taken by the, the Huygens just after uh, landing probe. And the, 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 the front uh, uh, row rocks here are basically uh, mostly ice rocks. So remember, 
the, the, the rock of the outer solar system is ice. So here you've got lots of ice on the surface. Uh, those, or the radius of, the, of that rock is about 20 centimeters large. So, uh, and you see that the surface is, is very, very um, hazy looking, right? And on the right hand side, you have this wonderful radar image of the Kraken Mare, which is actually um, Titan's largest liquid sea on the surface. And so this is something also very unique to Titan, which was discovered uh, by, by this mission, was this wide uh, variety of liquid seas and, and almost oceans on the surface of Titan. And it's not seas of water or anything, but it's more seas of methane, we think, and ethane. So these hydrocarbons that are produced on Titan uh, eventually can form these, these big uh, oceans. And so this has, you know, Cassini has been able to um, essentially follow and see the, the seasonal variations of, of these uh, these lakes and seas. Uh, and here you have, uh, you can see maybe the different islands. There's also islands on these on these uh, seas and lakes. So it's something that's very, uh, very interesting. And you get these channels, these erosion features that are very similar to Earth's features. Um, so it's a very rich uh, surface. And as a, as a comparison here, the, you have this, this big lake here, uh, and, and compared to Lake Superior in Michigan, uh, in the United States, you see that even this big lake here is, is much bigger than Lake Superior. So, you know, it's, it's something that's, that's, very, um, that's very targeted by, by the Cassini mission, and hopefully um, that was... Uh, oh, and also I wanted to point out that the, the first detection of this... Uh, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't have a, an image here, but the first detection of these seas was done, um, you know, sh uh, by looking at the reflection, uh, the light reflection off the the seas. So it was very very interesting. Okay, so finally, our third kind of stop here is Triton, which is another icy moon, an icy world, uh, in and of itself, at thirty times this time the Earth Sun distance. So very very far out in our solar system, where it gets really really cold. And Triton here, you can see, has a very, uh, very unique as well surface uh, geology, where uh, you, you you must be wondering, oh, why is why are do, don't we have a global uh, image of this uh, moon? Well, actually, uh, the only data we have of this moon are coming from uh, the Voyager spacecraft, which did a, a flyby of Triton uh, a couple decades ago, and but eventually just mapped out roughly the the half of the moon surface. So we don't, there's still a part of it that we still don't know what it looks like. But nonetheless, we get this uh, south pole here at the, at the bottom. And as you go up to higher latitudes near the equator, you see that you go from a more uh, rugged surface with different black patches. Then you get a smoother for surface and then kind of a bluish, grayish, and pinkish uh, uh, covered with ridges and surface as well. Kind of like uh, Europa's surface. So Triton's uh, orbit is also very unique because it has what we call a retrograde orbit. So it goes the other way around uh, than all the other moons in the planet. So and the other term is prograde. So in this case, it's retrograde. And not only that, but it's also very, very inclined, as you can see, uh, relative to the um, equatorial plane of the most of the moons, interior irregular moons, and Neptune itself. So it's a very... Uh, very, uh, very unique orbit as well. And so here, basically, was this was one of the first pictures taken by, uh, by the Voyager uh, spacecraft in the late uh, in 1980s, and of the of the Neptune system with Triton. So you can probably see Neptune at the at the top, and that little brownish dot at the bottom, which is Triton, uh, taken at the hundreds of millions of kilometers away, and. So here we get we get in 1989 uh, in August, uh, Voyager 2 does its first encounter of Triton. Here you have an image, a full scale image of the Voyager spacecraft. And what happened is that uh, the, the the Voyager 2 spacecraft did a very close approach of Neptune, and eventually flew by Triton, uh, as you can see uh, in this diagram here, five five hours later, uh, after the closest approach from from Neptune. And as it did this, uh, it kind of uh, helped, it kind of took 
Neptune's gravitational pull to come close to Triton and, and take as many pictures and as many uh, data as possible from that moon. And so on the surface of Triton, uh, again, it's very cold, very uh, covered in ice, and we get these very unique volcanic deposits, which are very smooth terrain, very bright terrain with a high albedo, with a high light reflection. Uh, you get a few craters here and there as well, but relatively speaking, a very young surface as well, uh, like, like Europa's. And so this also points out to a possible uh, earlier uh, age on Triton, where you had these uh, volcanic flows or kind of slush material that would flow from high uh, terrain to lower plains, for example, and uh, which also, you know, points out that Triton's uh, uh, interior must have some kind of, uh, of liquid ocean uh, under the surface which feeds this, this uh, resurfacing, we call it, of the surface of the track. Um, and something that to, to, to finish here, which, uh, which also was very unique to, uh, to the system, was the possible current active geyser activity on Triton. So on the left-hand side, you have a, a couple images of Triton. And you see different uh, black patches and, and black streaks, especially. And as you go, as the pictures go down, uh, it's it's the parallax is in, increased, and you can you can in that way get a, a kind of an edge-on view of Triton, and see that you know you see these longitudinal um, black streaks that happen here. And people thought that, uh, and still think that, and you can actually see it on the bigger picture on the right, these black streaks, which hint at a possible dust material and, and geyser activity that spews out some of that liquid material or, or, or dust like it, hap it happens on Europa or, or other moons like Enceladus. So this must be coming from somewhere, right? And so we think that it, it's probably coming from a subsurface ocean. Um, and this is a very, very limited and poorly constrained uh, kind of idea of this uh, interior of, of Triton where you get uh, you know, roughly similar uh, as on as on Europa, this ocean that's trapped between the silica mantle and an outer icy shell. And so, the very interesting thing about all of these moons and all of the, uh, the interest in, in studying them and their interior is, you know, this contact, especially between the mantle and the ocean, because on Earth we we see that you know you get this this rocky and and liquid water ocean contact at the bottom and the depths of the oceans on Earth. And there's things like hydrothermal vents and, and minerals that are being brought up from the mantle, uh, from the crust, uh, and, and feed your ocean with minerals and, and lots of good stuff for life, as we've seen on Earth. So that, and on the other side, we get these tides, these, this heating that, that may be coming from the mantle and, and radio, radioactivity in the mantle. It may be coming from tidal heating, it may be coming from obliquity uh, variations, it may be coming from many different sources. But at the end of the day, if you're able to bring this energy input uh, into your ocean, you may be able to feed your ocean with uh, any kind of uh, habitable and life-friendly uh, conditions that could sustain life in, on these worlds. So this is what this uh, this final uh, kind of artist depiction here shows, where you could get these these seafloor uh, hydrothermal vents, you know, bringing materials and, and minerals that are that are essential for any kind of uh, microbial or any kind of other um, life. I like to think of whales because uh, my favorite animals are whales. So I fantasize about Europa whales, for example. <laughs> but uh, you you know, essentially, one day maybe we we may be able to pierce and, and, and drill through that ice and, and kind of discover in situ um, the, this, this wonderful and possibly habitable um, um, water oceans, basically, on, the, on these moons. So I would like to, to finish this. I would like to thank um, uh, all of my advisors uh, here at Latmos in Paris and at JPL uh, who, who have the patience to work with me. <laughs> all of my uh, uh, good friends at uh, Outreach uh, at JPL. I would also like to thank uh, H2O, nitrogen, methane, all these wonderful molecules 
for giving us a job and, and things to study on. And the icy moon, the giant planets, which are so uh, fascinating in, in the solar system and probably beyond. And of course, to end, you know, entropy and tides, which I think are very crucial in understanding, as I was explaining, this, this kind of uh, energy that can happen uh, on these moons and, and sustain life possibly. So that's it. And with that, uh, Tanya Vad, and I'll take any questions. So um, thank you, David. That was fascinating. And even the slides were very interesting. And I'll ask Abhinav to uh, get to uh, get to some of the questions because I know our viewers are lined up with questions. So Abhinav, okay. go okay. ahead. Uh, Abhinav, are you still uh, muted? C can you check? Oh, hi, David. Hi, Mila. Hi. hi. Am I audible? Okay. Yeah. So, David, you will ple be really pleased to know that we've got uh, full, like, a lot of questions from a lot of schools from us. And uh, so are you ready so that I can uh, put in my questions from my schools over here? Yes. Do you want me okay. to switch over to stop the screen share? Uh, okay. Yeah, you can, yeah yes. you can stop the screen share so we can we can mm -hmm. see you <laughs> instead of the okay. screen now. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Okay. So, uh, David, here we have the first question. Okay. Uh, and yeah. this is from Ananya Sasdeva from GD Goenka Model Town. That what is in the seas under Europa's ice? What is in the seas? Yes, what is in the seas under Europa's ice? Well, that's a great question. Um, so, if you're t if you're thinking of the 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 sea composition, the ocean, the liquid water uh, composition, we think that it's it's pretty similar to Earth's liquid water oceans on Earth, with a very you know salty composition, uh, NaCl, sodium chloride. And why do we think that? Is that um, you know the the Galileo spacecraft, which we talked about kind of detected some some uh, anomalies in the environment in, around Europa. And I'm, t I'm talking about Europa, but it, it could be the case for other moons as well, uh, where your your magnetic field was locally disturbed uh, that, that, and if you trace that back, you would trace that back to Europa's ocean and give it a more conductive um, uh, medium, so to speak. And so this conductive medium would probably happen thanks to any kind of salts in the ocean that uh, that are you know we, we know on Earth from from, from everyday uh, life and experience that you know salt is conductive and, and if you put that in the in the liquid water ocean that could that could happen and so we have again as I said we have a very poor understanding of the of the ocean the composition the depth the liquid the thicknesses and so forth uh, that's why our, 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 our theoretical modeling uh, tries to constrain. But um, all in all, it's uh, it's still an open question. Yes. Okay. So we have the second question over here. So it's the question is from Anchal. It's she says, is it possible that Europa can collide with Jupiter if the tidal effect on it increases? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I think uh, I think at this point it's it's reached. Uh, so I think there's maybe a couple things to take into account. The first thing is what we call the resonance. You know, I don't know if she, uh, she knows about the resonance, but the resonance basically is your interaction, a stable interaction um, that happens between the moons themselves. So around Jupiter, the four main what we call Galilean moons, uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, have entered this kind of resonance where they interact with one another and kind of reach this stable state. So I don't think at this point it would uh, anyhow crash with Jupiter. But then if you if you would imagine things like, you know, uh, having a very high eccentricity or, or simply uh, like in, in the case of Triton, for example, you know, remember I talked about this retrograde orbit. Um, right. And the cool thing about Triton is that it has a very, very low eccentricity, very almost zero. So its orbit is almost uh, cir perfectly circular. circular. And uh, because of this, you know, we think that Maybe in millions of years it will come closer and closer to to Neptune, uh, as one of uh, Mars's moons does, and possibly you know break break up, break itself up, or or just uh, collide with 
the time. So, yeah, ex eccentricity is something that's very thought of not only for tides, but also for orbital evolutions of planets and solar systems. Okay, so we have this question from uh, Purvesh, uh, and he's from Presidium Gurgaon. So if there is if there is water under the surface of Titan, then would there be a sign of microscopic life? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> uh, so in Titan, the, the liquids, the surface liquids, first of all, are, are uh, as I said, methane rich. So, you know, on Earth we have methane uh, that actually can be trapped uh, under the near the seafloor or on continental ridges where you get uh, this uh, icy uh, methane that eventually, you know, as, as it's been shown in Antarctica and so forth, uh, due to, to global uh, climate change and temperature variations that can be released into the atmosphere and the gas phase. But on Titan, uh, things are a little different because you've got, it condenses, it's so cold that it actually reaches this liquid state. Uh, so if there's any microscopic uh, evidence of life on Titan, it would be very different from that of Earth's and everything we know about life on Earth's because uh, there's very there's hardly any oxygen on, on Titan. Um, it's mostly you know, nitrogen and methane uh, dominant. So that's about the surface. And then about the, the subsurface ocean, uh, trying to answer the question, is that uh, this ocean, we think, is also rich in ammonia, so the molecule NH3. And ammonia, again, would, would uh, this kind of uh, H2O and ammonia mixture uh, would also be, be very unique and, and, and defy any expectations of any kind of life that we know on Earth. Uh, but I think uh, that's the main interest of possible future missions to Titan, which would be to uh, kind of get a closer look, have a more uh, continuous study and uh, monitoring of the surface of Titan, and then maybe, who knows, uh, there's, there's projects uh, preliminary projects thinking of maybe sending a, a boats and, and submarines on the liquid oceans of, um, of Titan. But maybe, who knows, detect any kind of micro microscopic uh, life in the, in the seas. Who knows? That would be great. <laughs> so uh, when you mean, uh, you know, when you've been talking about icy planets uh, or icy moons, you're not really talking about water ice as it's uh, here on Earth, but it, the ice is a composition, it's a mix of water and ammonia or methane so on right it's a different kind of ice yeah that's the right question so for example in most cases like Europa or, or Titan or Triton sorry or Enceladus around Saturn uh, the, the, the the main component of these ices is still water H2O but as you said there's a lot of contaminants like we think table salt salt there was a study that showed that uh, that does uh, experimental uh, simulations where you can can take actually water ice and may also take some table salt and irradiate that at very high energies and see the chemistry uh, evolution of that and compare that you know, on a larger scale on Europa, for example, on the surface. So there's probably a lot, and you know, if, if we look at the, the Europa pictures we showed earlier, we see that there's, there's a lot of reddish stuff, a lot of that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, gunk on the surface, the, the reddish brownish stuff. And that, we think, is, is uh, contaminants like uh, different uh, salts, basically. Potassium, it could be sodium, it could be, it could be sulfur, it could be a lot of things, yes. Okay, so uh, here we have a question from Soumya Dhingra, and she's from GD Goenka Public School Model Town. So she asks, would we be able to detect signs of life from the contents of a water plume from Europa? Ah, that's a great question. Um, so the Cassini, um, I'm going to start by answering that the Cassini mission, uh, I didn't show any images here of Enceladus, but also, you know, we could talk for hours and hours about Enceladus as well, although it's not my, my, my specialty. Um, but uh, it has this very active geyser and plume system. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of those, uh, those dust and, and particles and that ice, uh, ice particles coming out and the Cassini spacecraft actually went through those geysers and kind of did a sampling of the, of the particles. So I think uh, in terms of the, the new Europa Clipper mission, uh, which will be to hopefully analyze in situ these particles and these geysers, 
will at least be able to, I think, um, kind of get the composition of these, these minerals and uh, the particles that come out of the, all the way up and down from the ocean. But then, you know, if uh, I don't think there's any instrument uh, that will be able to really uh, you know, detect or see any, any, any life forms or anything, if there are any. Uh, but at least you could get things like um, isotopic ratios or molecular ratios that maybe could tell you and give you an idea of the internal structure and then infer you know, your oxygen contents, uh, your hydrogen composition, and maybe you know, constrain. It's all about constraining your, your up, upper and lower limits to, uh, to life, basically, or habitable conditions. Yes. So uh, before you ask your next question, Abhinav, could mm. I ask you, David, can you stay on an extra 10 minutes? Because we still have a lot of questions, and uh, you know, <laughs> students want to get their questions in. So <laughs> is sure, that OK? Sure. And I'll, I'll, uh, David and Abhinav, I'll, uh, I'm going to uh, extend this for another 10 minutes. So yeah, sure. yeah. go ahead. Sure, okay. Okay. Abhinav, okay. Abhinav, okay. So I can uh, uh, ask in my another question. So I have this question from uh, Seerat Ghai, and he's from Ryan International School, Vasant Kunch. He asks, if we are able to form a society at one of these moons, what do you and how long will it last? Oh, <laughs> this is kind of a futuristic question. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's about so space settlements. It's a philosophical question. It's an engineering question. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, I, I think from my humbling experience, uh, what I can, I like to read books about uh, science fiction books about you know uh, human bases on on these moons. I'm actually reading one one right now on, on Titan. We have this uh, this base set up on Titan. And um, so what, really thinking of things uh, on the very long time scale is that, you know, the, the sun is going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, you know, planets like Mercury, Venus, the Earth are, are in millions and millions of years are not going to be habitable anymore and life-friendly to us if we're still there to, to see that. But then places like Jupiter and these, these wonderful uh, icy worlds uh, environments Will, will be uh, in environments that will be actually maybe more uh, prone to any kind of uh, possible uh, life-friendly conditions on, on the surface, if it's for us humans, for example. So I think uh, if ever we were able to survive that long and create any bases on Europa, on, on Titan, or uh, who knows, be the first uh, aquanaut on Europa's oceans uh, and kind of uh, drill through that and you could maybe protect yourself on the, you know, those big ridges and big cracks and, and, and caves. You can maybe protect yourself from the radiation on the on the on the surface, and be the first aquanaut, uh, which would be a nice uh, record uh, on Europa. So yeah, I think, uh, and uh, for example, on Titan as well, this this atmosphere, which is very stable and, and very uh, yeah very stable on geologic times, uh, for sure that would, would that would as far as pressure goes and, and kind of uh, an analog to Earth's pressure, that would be a nice uh, place to hang out, I think, as well. Uh, I don't think I would go to Triton because it's way too cold, uh, but I wouldn't, mind, uh, I wouldn't mind doing some jet skiing on, on Titan's surface. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so I have this question from Ananya, and uh, she's from St. Thomas School, Dwarka, and she asks, how we discovered global oceans on Europa? How 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 do we dis how would we discover? Yes, how, how did, we, did discovered, we discover? How did oh. we discover the global ocean on Europa? Yeah. So as I, as I kind of explained earlier, um, the the Galileo spacecraft detected some uh, magnetic field anomalies in, around Jupiter and around uh, Europa, and that kind of uh, that kind of Pumped or, or confirmed earlier hypotheses of this uh, subsurface liquid ocean because as it's probably very conductive and that's also hopefully the, the Europa Clipper mission will be able to uh, constrain that as well um, that this ocean there is some kind of liquid uh, thickness at some point that uh, that provides with this and then I would say the second uh, the second and the second and third um, uh, arguments for this was uh, the surface geology. 
because you know as we saw with a couple of those pictures you see these these terrain this chaotic terrain these uh, maculae and so forth that um, that hint and pertain at a probable uh, subsurface ocean that kind of melts your um, your your surface thanks to the tidal heating again and to that mental heating that comes up from the tides and so this um, this can be provided thanks and through a liquid ocean uh, as as a heat conduct conductor basically and then I guess the third argument would be a more theoretical one um, there's uh, you know the math is pretty consistent as far as uh, calculating and kind of getting an idea of the thicknesses and the interior structure and we use things called the love numbers which uh, when you calculate them you can calculate those love numbers for any kind of, of body in this rocky body in the solar system um, and those love numbers uh, when you calculate them uh, depending on, on different thicknesses you consider for each layer you can actually infer uh, an, a, a rough approximate um, interior structure of a, of a, of a moon of a, of a planet and so forth so kind of the observational and, 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 and surface geology and theoretical approach kind of give you a strong argument that there is this global ocean on the river. And also I forgot to mention that um, the Hubble Space Telescope has been uh, actively looking at Europa and trying to see if there's any of these clues that come out as, as, as some of the observations have shown that yes there there are some H2O, some water venting happening on Europa that is probably being fed by that ocean. Okay, so we have one more question from Gateway International, and this question is from Vivek. That are there any other moons which may contain ocean, like we talked about, you know, Europa, Titan, and Triton? So he wants to know some more moons which might contain uh, oceans like these, or oh, icy good. moons, other icy moons. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There are there are many of them. Uh, there are moons like Mimas. There are there are. Uh, objects like uh, Ceres, uh, maybe even Vesta, uh, Enceladus, the moon around Saturn. Uh, all these these bodies we think have some kind of, a, of, a, of an ocean in, in below the surface. Um, so it's something that uh, you know even even uh, bodies like Ganymede or Callisto around Jupiter are thought to have uh, liquid water oceans. And then you got the moon Io, which is very different because Io is very close to Jupiter, and it's the most volcanically active body in the solar system. Uh, and so maybe who knows? There could be not maybe not a, a water ocean, but more of a magma ocean or some sort um, that uh, that is very hot and kind of create all of these volcanoes on the surface. So yeah, you have a, a lot of uh, of these bodies. You know, maybe even Pluto. Maybe even Pluto. There, there could be some some subsurface liquid oceans. So it's a very uh, it's a very interesting prospect for, as I said, uh, searching for life in the, in the solar system. I think. So I have one other question from Lakshya Gupta, and he's from Presidium uh, School, Gurgaon. And the question is: Does visible light enter Titan's thick atmosphere? Uh, that's a great question. Um, Visible light is uh, it does not I mean does not is not being reflected. Uh, that's why you know if you were to go or if you we just look at uh, visible pictures of Titan, you don't see the surface. But then if you start looking at more infrared or even uh, ultraviolet UV uh, spectra, you actually get to 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 kind of s that reaches the surface basically. And the, 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 you know, you remember probably the, the radar picture I showed of Titan's surface. A radar is a very, very powerful tool that, uh, that is being used by, by all these missions to really poke through that atmosphere and then bouncing off the surface and reaching back the spacecraft and eventually seeing the unseen and seeing the surface of, of Titan. So, you know, there's, there's, two, there's two ways of thinking. Of it. Like, you could use radar really to, to, to go through this thick atmosphere or you could, you know, as we do in the lab too, we try to understand the, the surface chemistry, the middle and lower atmosphere chemistry. And so to do this, we try to uh, fit our data and fit our understanding to, to uh, observations on Titan and essentially um, 
you know, determine where uh, different uh, different wavelengths and different uh, spectral windows reach at which altitude. And take. So visible clearly uh, can't tell you much, except that it's a big orange ball, uh, opaque ball. But uh, but really, um, where things get interesting is is in, is in UV and infrared uh, spectrum. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I've been up. Yes. Yeah, maybe you. Uh, maybe we just have time for one, one or two more question. questions. So yeah, go ahead and pick the. So, so last David, question. here's one last question for you, and this is a really interesting question because this interests me a lot. Okay, and uh, this question is asked by Ram, and he's from Presidium Guru Gurugram, and uh, the question says, "Can we see the auroras of Saturn from the surface of Titan?" Oh, <laughs> that's a great question. I never thought about that. <laughs> um, for sure, we can see them from outside of Titan. <laughs> uh, but I think, I think really, maybe if we had some powerful telescopes, or as we were just talking about, different uh, different techniques of seeing at different wavelengths, we could see uh, we could see some things, or, or some at least maybe uh, I don't know, radio or electrical signals. But really, seeing them as we see. Railway on Earth, for example, I don't think so. Because remember that picture of, of Huygens, that very thick atmosphere, the the haze would. Uh, but something I, I like to think of sometimes is, uh, what if I were to be on Titan surface right now? What would things look like? And I think it would even in broad daylight, it would be rather um, uh, dark, you know, because this all of this haze, this opaque haze, would kind of blind you. You could probably see like maybe a couple dozen meters away from you, but other than that, you know, you would not see a lot because it's 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 probably very uh, you know, opaque because of that haze. So I think it would be very hard to, on the, on the other hand, if you were on, on, on Europa's surface, maybe there you would have a, a better chance of, of doing such observations. <laughs> okay, uh, David, thanks a lot for answering all these questions from all yeah. of our lovely students. Okay, so yeah. I'll finally hand it over to Mila so she can conclude yes, so the talk. If, and and David, just, uh, just one uh, last thing. If any of the students have any questions, please feel free, or anybody, please feel free to write me an email. And can we, um, when you next visit India, we are again going to invite you to see if you can come and do a live interaction at one of our schools so maybe the students can meet you real time. Oh, and. Yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking of. Uh, I would love to go back at some time, maybe next year. So I, I, I will see. Okay. Okay. And we'll be in, uh, we'll be in touch and invite yes. you for that. So that'll be a great opportunity. With pleasure. Yeah. 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 And we are looking forward to the Cassini plunge because it's probably going to tell us a lot more at that time. And um, so, uh, Sorry, do you have any you comments on that on the Cassini final plunge? That's going to uh, come up. Is that going to tell us a lot more uh, at that time? Yeah. Um, so with with this final grand finale phase, where right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for the first time ever, the we'll get uh, we'll get data, we'll get images from really up close uh, at uh, Saturn, and for the first time, it will go through that innermost uh, rings, ring, set of rings, and the planet itself. So there, there's going to be a lot of interest, in, and that's going to help uh, uh, scientists especially interested in, in, in understanding the, the formation and the density and the mass of these rings, uh, because they're, they're, there's a lot of them, and, and all of those rings are made out of uh, blocks of ice, especially. So that's going to be a, a, a new I think, interest, uh, thanks to this grand finale phase. And also something that uh, my personal opinion is that uh, we'll, there's a lot of us that are going to be very sad uh, because of this last Titan uh, close flyby. I just came back from a, a conference at, in, at NASA Goddard in the, in the States where we had um, the, this kind of last uh, Titan workshop during the Cassini era. And so it was very emotional because there was a lot of final, you know, Discussion about about uh, this grand finale and, and, and future missions and so forth. So, especially for people who have been working on this mission for 
for decades and decades, um, it's going to be a, a very uh, interesting time. And, uh, so that's why we need new, bright young minds like uh, like the ones who are probably listening right now to think of new missions and, and uh, uh, to explore Titan. <laughs> So thank you, David, and uh, students, if you have any more questions, uh, please uh, uh, you know, let us know at Space, so we'll, we'll go ahead and give you his email, and you can contact him. Uh, that was a great talk, David, and thank you, Abhinav, uh, for being with us and asking all the questions. So Thank you, Mila. Thank you, David. Thank you, Abhinav. Thank you, Mila. And next time, uh, David, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, David is also a Bhangra dancer. <laughs> and he's going to be doing a sh show tonight. So next time we have him online, we'll start with a clip of that. So, <laughs> Might be. Yeah, we can okay. have a live Bhangra performance. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, my, my good friend, uh, Apurva Oza, and I are thinking of making a, what we call Astro, astro uh, Bhangra. Which be, <laughs> right. and, which we, and we have a lot of Bhangra dancers here, so I'm sure we'd love to join in and yes. so thank you participants and we had a you know we had a great audience today we have a lot of viewers so uh thanks to everybody for joining in and uh let's thank keep you. the momentum going for global astronomy month yes, uh, yes. good luck with that and have fun okay, okay. thank you david and thank you Abhinav. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. good day everybody thank you